100% studies have shown that supplementing with collagen increases your own endogenous collagen synthesis. Randomized studies in humans showing that collagen can benefit anywhere from bone health, blood pressure, even muscle mass and strength. Welcome to the Seam Lung Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lund, and our guest today is Dr. James Nicola Antonio. Dr. James and I have finished another book together called The Collagen Cure, The Forgotten Role of Glycine and Collagen in Optimal Health and Longevity. You can get the book from Amazon. James, welcome back to the show. Seem, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like our sixth book together now, The Collagen Cure. And uh, yeah, I'm actually pretty excited about it. It was like very you know, surprising for me when writing it about like how how impactful and, and how important collagen and like, you know, this connective tissue actually is to, you know, overall health. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting topic because it's, it seems to be that most people are not just like ingesting a suboptimal intake of glycine and collagen, but even potentially not enough to support just basic metabolic functions. So that's, and there's really not a whole lot of nutrients that you can really say that for. Um, so from that aspect, and in addition, the fact that actually supplementing with fairly high doses of collagen and glycine can also provide a lot of benefits um, to even healthy people, but certainly people with um, different health issues uh, makes it really an appealing book um, for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, you know, one of the few, like, compounds that pretty much everyone actually could benefit from, because, you know, I mean, everyone ages, everyone will experience some aspects of, you know, collagen degeneration and, uh, you know, skin degeneration and uh, joint degeneration. So, yeah, it's like pretty much for everyone, for all ages, pretty much that would be needed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But what about, let's say, you know, collagen is considered at least like many years ago, I was thinking that collagen is like this kind of, you know, scheme or <laughs> that it's not actually like doesn't have any effect. So what, what, what is like the actual like research showing, you know, the effects of collagen? I will start with the yeah, collagen, like the effects of collagen on, uh, you know, what, what they say that it helps with. Right. So essentially that sort of um, thinking, uh, inaccurate thinking can also be applied to glycine and the fact that a lot of people don't believe that collagen is beneficial because our own cells can synthesize collagen, right? Um, and in the same line of thinking, uh, we can synthesize glycine. So it's a non-essential amino acid. So from both those perspectives, you can say, or you can you know, inaccurately think that there's no benefit to actually taking exogenous sources of collagen or glycine because our body can make each, right? Yeah. But the problem with that is the fact that in order for our cells to actually make collagen, they need to have certain amino acid precursors to do that. And you really don't get high amounts of those in the diet, um, particularly glycine, but also proline and hydroxyproline. So by taking a collagen supplement, you're getting more of the building blocks that your body needs to synthesize collagen. So in other words, 100% studies have shown that supplementing with collagen increases your own endogenous collagen synthesis the thickness of tendons and ligaments, the strength of those, um, the improvements in skin health, obviously, as well. So there's numerous randomized studies in humans showing that collagen can benefit anywhere from bone health, blood pressure, even muscle mass and strength, um, because collagen is obviously important, um, uh, not just for tendons and ligaments, but also muscle health as well. So from the perspective of not just the fact that it's inaccurate to say that your body makes collagen so it doesn't need it, um, but also we have studies to support the, the benefits of that. So the second reason why it's kind of inaccurate to think, okay, taking collagen isn't going to be beneficial because my body can make it, is the fact that when you actually ingest collagen peptides, you ingest a lot of those peptides intact, not just the amino acids, um, but the actual dye peptides, and those can actually stimulate receptors. They can get into the joints and they can stimulate and increase the synthesis of your body's own endogenous collagen production. So from those two perspectives, ingesting collagen will benefit collagen health. And then we also are at a huge glycine deficit. So adding glycine to collagen um, mm. is going to be beneficial, even though about one out of every three amino acids in collagen is made up of glycine. 
on a, on a net scale of how much you're getting per 10 grams, let's say you get two and a half of glycine, that's still probably not an optimal amount. So adding in five to 10 grams of glycine would actually help not just collagen synthesis, but many aspects of health. Mm, yeah, I, I agree. And uh, yeah, when it comes to glycine, then, um, you know, the same applies that the glycine is considered non-essential because your body can make it itself, but the amount is very small. Like your body can make only three grams of glycine per day, which, you know, for optimal health, you definitely need like, a lot more for, you know, covering not only the collagen turnover, but also uh, you know, glutathione synthesis, creatine synthesis and heme synthesis and uh, yeah, many like, you know, effects that you actually would want. Exactly. So essentially when the glycine cleavage pathway and, and other pathways formed, um, glycine methylation pathways, it occurred about 500 million years ago in small vertebrates. Okay. And that pathway never evolved to form more glycine based on basically vertebrates growth over millions of years. So it, it evolved in very small vertebrates and three grams was enough to support small mammals. But with the increasing weight, certainly anything, any mammal 88 pounds or higher, three grams is not nearly enough for optimal collagen turnover. We know that about at a conservative estimate, we're lacking about 10 to 12 grams of glycine in the diet to support optimal collagen turnover, but it could be as high as 36 grams. We're not entirely sure because this depends on collagen turnover and the glycine reutilization rate based on collagen turnover. And that's really probably anywhere between 80 and 98%. Using the conservative estimate of 95%, um, we would require about 12 grams of glycine to support optimal collagen turnover. Using a more less conservative of 85%, which many other amino acids actually have an 85% recycle rate you're looking at 36 grams and where you only get about anywhere from one and a half to three grams of glycine in the diet. So that basically creates a, a, a net deficit of anywhere from like, let's say 10 to 34 grams of glycine. Mm -hmm. So the, the reason why the glycine synthesis system um, never improved is because in, in why endogenous synthesis really isn't um, enough for not just optimal health, but even in certain individuals, basic metabolic functions is because glycine synthesis is dependent on basically methylfolate needs and not glycine needs. So essentially we synthesize glycine from serine and basically serine's carbon is used for the methyl group to methylate folate. And then that serine turns into glycine. So through methylating folate, we synthesize about 1.1 grams of glycine. But if you have the, if you're homozygous for the MTHFR mutation, then your methylation goes down like by 75%. So your synthesis of glycine in those individuals could theoretically go down by 75%. So instead of synthesizing 1.1 grams out of the three, you're only synthesizing 0.2. In other words, the three grams that's needed to form things like creatine, glutathione, heme, bile salts. Now you're only synthesizing about two. You're not even synthesizing enough to support basic metabolic function. So health issues start to creep up when you're not synthesizing enough creatine, glutathione is an antioxidant, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so. Yeah, like, like, uh, yeah, sorry. yeah so I'll, I'll just, you know, explain that, you know, your body makes three grams of glycine, you know, optimally or you like let's say theoretically it can make three grams and three grams would go to the basic metabolic functions like you know glutathione creatine heme and bile salts and then there's the collagen turnover that has conservative estimate that you need 12 grams of glycine for that and the less conservative is like 36 grams so it's like yeah your body makes three the three grams would go for the basic metabolic functions so you're lacking 12 grams in a conservative scenario and uh, theoretically you could also need up to 36 grams of extra glycine uh, per day even to cover besides covering the basic metabolic uh, functions so it's yeah like a huge like a sink in there yeah and so we almost need to like sort of reevaluate our definition of an essential amino acid it really shouldn't be based on can the body produce it? It really should be based on is 95% of the population synthesizing enough 
to not just really support basic health and living, which in many cases, I don't think um, this endogenous synthesis actually is even enough to support basic metabolic functions to create a, a just a normal, healthy individual, but for optimal um, health effects as well. So it is totally 100% a conditionally essential amino acid is really what we should define it as. Um, but many would actually argue that it shouldn't even be considered non-essential um, because there's so many situations that increase your glycine need nowadays versus compared to evolutionary time. So most of us are in a chronic low-grade inflammatory condition. And we know that inflammatory proteins like C-reactive protein literally contain glycine. So the more inflammation you have and the more inflammatory proteins you synthesize, you deplete your glycine pool even further because it's needed to form things like C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory protein. Even more so in an inflammatory condition, which most of us are suffering from, you need more glutathione, which is your body's master antioxidant to handle the excess inflammation. And as we said before, glycine is needed to synthesize glutathione. So you further deplete your glycine pool when you have inflammation to produce more glutathione to suppress the inflammation. And this isn't even taking into account the gastrointestinal issues that people have and don't, let's say, absorb glycine well, the kidney dysfunction that can cause more loss of glycine in the urine, and many things like coffee, um, beverages, anything that, that forms or contains benzoic acid will bind to glycine, form hipperic acid, and then you excrete it out in the urine causing glycine depletion. So one cup of coffee basically causes us to lose um, 100 milligrams of glycine. And so most people are consuming four cups of coffee, further depleting their glycine pool by up to maybe 400 milligrams per day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's actually quite uh, significant or like significant, um, you know, inadequacy or a deficit that people have. And, you know, on top, let's say even if you have the optimal intake of glycine, then I mean, glycine already has like additional benefits as well, like better blood sugar regulation, better sleep, more like, you know, this uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter activity that makes you more calm and uh, relaxed, helps with exercise performance. So yeah, I mean, like, I don't see like a reason why you wouldn't want to take at least some, some amount of glycine in your day. Right. And so we were sort of just talking about like the endogenous functions of glycine, right? Um, in the formation of glutathione, that's important for thinning out mucus. That's important as a master antioxidant. That's an important for combining with the nitric oxide um, to form nitroso um, glutathione, which is a bronchodilator, important for breathing and asthmatics. So just basic functions are going to be improved when you improve your glycine status. But in addition to that, what you're referring to is exogenous supplementation of glycine, which in numerous studies in, in humans and animals has been not only shown to extend lifespan in, in animals and rodents up to 30 to 40%, which very few supplements have ever been shown to do that. Um, human clinical trials show that anywhere from five grams, three times a day of glycine to five grams, four times a day, basically with meals can decrease the glucose spike by about 30%, can dramatically improve A1C, which is like the three month average of uh, glucose levels can improve blood pressure and numerous markers of metabolic syndrome um, and inflammation as well, because there's glycine receptors on our immune cells. And when you have good amounts of glycine, you sort of suppress over inflammation that can occur, um, which when you start thinking about cytokine storms, that's important as well. So there is this benefit to supplementing and, and it's, there's a lot of safety as well with glycine. We had, there's studies going on at least a year in schizophrenic patients using up to 60 to 80 grams of glycine per day, showing no real issues and, and improvements in both positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, and as you said, it's, a, it's also a neurotransmitter. Um, it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so it may help with um, muscle spasms and cramps in exercise. It does have a calming effect. It does decrease core body temperature, which is why taking three grams of glycine an hour before sleep can improve um, getting into sleep because your body has to go down by two degrees Fahrenheit to basically fall asleep. So glycine helps with the decrease in core body temperature to do that. And it helps with absorption of sodium and fluids. So it's great to put in high salt solutions before athletic performance. Um, and then, you know, as we're talking about, you know, supplementing and what dose and who, and who's have shown benefits in clinical studies, um, and we talked about, you know, the animal studies on life extension. The reason why glycine seems to help with life extension beyond just glutathione and detoxification, there's numerous pathways that actually 
require glycine for detoxification um, from like things like benzoate um, and salicylates in order to detox, detoxify from those which are high in like nuts and, and seeds and spices. Um, you need glycine. Um, and it's not just that, it's also this methionine restriction kind of thing going on with glycine in the sense that methionine restriction, right? Calorie restriction seems to prolong life in animals, but we know in humans, it doesn't because you need good amounts of protein. Um, so in that aspect, a lot of people are now switching over to a high protein diet, which is great for muscle mass building, but the more methionine you have, the more glycine you need. We think anywhere between 0.5 to one grams of glycine per gram of methionine. And the reason is, is because glycine is our endogenous buffer to too many methyl groups. And when you consume a lot of muscle meat, you're getting a lot of methionine. So you're getting a lot of methyl groups, but that's going to tax your glycine status because there's two pathways that can occur when glycine gets methylated. It'll either bring that methyl group into the mitochondria and, and deliver it to unmethylated folate. Or if you don't have enough unmethylated folate, then the methylated glycine gets excreted out the urine. So essentially high methionine and high methyl groups that you don't need, you don't have an unmethylated folate to use that methyl group will bind to glycine, create methylglycine and you lose it in the urine. So you need more glycine to eat a high muscle meat diet. And most people aren't consuming collagenous meats, right? Like drumsticks, turkey knocks, skin um, on salmon, things like that. And they're not getting glycine. So they're further depleting their glycine because they're on a high methionine intake. And so that's why probably glycine also too has some longevity lifespan extending properties because it helps balance methionine overdose, which um, in the post-absorptive state will increase homocysteine um, and also basically increase markers of fatty liver disease and all these other things. So high methionine isn't good per se, if it's not balanced with glycine. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's many, uh, most of the, like, like methionine restriction and longevity studies do find any, any animals that find that, yeah, that glycine is like mimics those effects. And, uh, it's a very like, important, I think to consider, um, and I mean, yeah, like, you know, uh, ancestrally, you would eat like nose to tail, which uh, you get like, you know, the muscle meat from the methionine and uh, the glycine and collagen from the connective tissue and the organs and stuff like that. Yeah, but uh, they're like, what, what foods, let's say, have high amounts of glycine and uh, collagen? Like, I think many people just not, they're not getting the optimal amounts because they're actually not eating those kind of foods generally. Right. Um, so to, so to be clear too, I don't think that even consuming these foods is going to give you an optimal intake of glycine, um, because just from the evolutionary perspective, there's too much of a deficit of glycine for an optimal collagen turnover to be offset even by consuming collagenous foods, because again, getting 10 grams of collagen from skin is still only going to get you maybe two to three grams of glycine. Um, but it, with that being said, uh, you can make quality or consume quality collagenous bone broths if it actually contains a lot of gelatin. And you'll know that once you put it in the fridge overnight and you, you'll see most of it will solidify as gelatin if it has a lot of collagen slash gelatin in it. But most bone broths do not. You'll put most bone broths in the fridge and there won't even be a little skim of gelatin on it, which that's really the key to know. Does this contain a lot of gelatin, aka cooked collagen um, or not. Um, with that being said, though, you use collagenous parts of the animal to form these gelatinous broth broths. So it would be things like turkey knocks, drumsticks, skins um, to create actually good amounts of collagen and to get some glycine. Well, those are the foods that will actually have it. You can get also collagen from bone, cooked bone marrow as well. Mm. Yeah. And uh, like pork skin is very high in glycine but i mean <laughs> many people really make it may only mostly like in china and asia they do eat pork skin uh we, we eat here in estonia we have like some you can find like pork ears uh pork like slices of the skin pork tails and stuff like that and pork legs with this with the skin on and we make like this gelatinous is it like a traditional food like gelatinous uh yeah like gelatinous uh meat stew Mm -hmm. like meat jello <laughs> so you cook it and you get put you cook the pork legs and stuff and you get like the yeah, like glue 
type of uh, jello and you freeze it so it becomes like yeah just meat jello <laughs> it's actually pretty tasty uh, but yeah like you know you have to be pre- you have to be pre- eating pretty much yeah these you know very ge- gelatinous and tendon ligaments and skins and those kind of things to get like very significant amounts of uh, or actual amounts of like you know glycine and collagen and uh yeah from like you do get like small amounts of glycine from let's say some meats as well like you know some actual just fish and uh muscle meat but it's again like somewhat lower and you get you know more methanine from that so you need to again balance it further with more glycine yeah yeah i think you know reason too why um collagen is starting to starting to gain a lot of traction is we're just starting to realize that or you know many people in the mainstream are just starting to realize that collagen is the most abundant protein in your body. It makes up 30 to 35% of all your protein. And we're mostly water, but after that, we're mostly protein. So if it's the greatest constituent of the second most abundant substance in your body, maybe this substance may actually have some benefits when you supplement with it. And it turns out it does. And we're also starting to learn that the amount of collagen in our tissues dramatically goes down with age. Now, we don't really have good studies on the collagen in bone as we age. Um, There are a few, um, and it definitely does show a significant decrease. Um, But we do have good studies on skin collagen content, and we do lose just under 10% um, of our collagen in our skin starting at the age of 20 every decade. So, you know, basically by the time you're 70, you've lost, you know, I don't know, somewhere around like 40 to 50% of the collagen in your actual skin, either through increased breakdown or just not enough to synthesize it and to support optimal levels. So just from looking youthful from the vein perspective, which unfortunately a lot of people care more about their aesthetic appearance than actual their physical health, um, unless you follow like me or you, then you're probably more so on the other side of the spectrum, but there is benefits to your actual physical appearance, wrinkles, brown spots on um, the suppleness of your skin will improve with collagen supplementation as well. Mm, yeah. So you do think that it's kind of worthwhile to take a quality collagen supplement as well on top of eating, you know, the collagenous foods. I do. Yep. I think, I think it just kind of hedges your that's a little bit better. You cover your bases better. Um, I think anywhere from 10 to 20 grams in high elite athletes, maybe even up to 40 grams will provide more better optimal collagen turnover. Your joints will feel a lot better too. Um, and I've definitely worked with some high um, elite athletes and definitely increasing their collagen intake for 20 to 40 grams has helped their joint pain um, significantly. Gotcha. And uh, what what amounts and what like types of collagen because there's you know marine bovine what do you think is most optimal yeah i think you can argue like you know back and forth on okay bovine does have smaller peptides typically and might be absorbed a little bit better um uh, the marine excuse me uh has a little bit better absorption than bovine um there's more type three in bovine hide collagens versus marine Um, I think it's on the fringe regarding like what's slightly better. I think the most important thing is getting around 10 to 20 grams of type one hydrolyzed collagen. Um, And then in addition to that, I do think it's important to consume about one to two grams of type two collagen, which is the collagen that makes up your cartilage. So that's important for joints specifically, although type one collagen can also um, increase the synthesis of type two collagen in the body. So but I do think combining both is important. And I do think consuming hydrolyzed eggshell membrane will also provide additional benefits um, as well because it, it provides additional constituents of the joints to improve joint health as well. So 500 milligrams of hydrolyzed um, eggshell membrane has been shown to there in numerous, like I think at least six clinical studies, maybe more, uh, to improve joint pain, um, joint health, things like that. Mm. Um, so... Beyond that, uh, if you're consuming a good collagenous gelatin broth too, that's going to give you um, decent amounts of uh, collagen precursors, but you do get better absorption from hydrolyzed collagen peptides versus collagen in the diet. So there is um, benefits to supplementing with actual collagen. Yeah. And yeah, it's very hard to get all, all the collagen and the glycine you need from just uh, the diet resource. So it's much easier. Yep. To- a supplement um and you know in the modern world where our demand is bigger than yeah like supplementing makes sense as well yeah 
And uh, the glycine amount is like, yeah, I would say like, you know, at least 10 grams everyone needs <laughs> pretty much. And uh, more like 15 grams probably for uh, most people. Yeah. And then there's also things that sort of tax and break down your own collagen synthesis. So oral birth control has been shown in, in two clinical studies in humans to dramatically suppress collagen synthesis because estrogen is important for that. Um, so after menopause, collagen synthesis really goes down um, because of the estrogen drop. Cortisol and stress will break down collagen more. Inflammation will break down collagen more. So really just, you know, having a low inflammatory state will help preserve and reduce the breakdown of your own collagen. So beyond just getting the supplements and the precursors, it's really important to also live an overall healthy lifestyle so that you're not excessively breaking down the collagen that you have. Yeah. Yeah. And from the, you know, healthy diet, then there's uh, like other micronutrients as well needed for the collagen synthesis. Especially the main one is like when the vitamin C and uh, copper is also like the main needed for the collagen synthesis. Yeah, it's an interesting story. We have a chapter on uh, vitamin C and collagen deficiency as a potential cause of, or leading cause of heart disease. And the fact that um, uh, autopsies have shown that most clots, most coronary artery clots um, start from a bleed, essentially a capillary bleed. In other words, capillary fragility um, potentially caused by vitamin C deficiency, copper deficiency, collagen deficiency is what's cause, causing the capillaries to rupture, bleed, and then there's a clot that forms because of the bleed. So it's almost like don't blame the clot itself, blame what caused the clot. And we have some compelling evidence that a lack of nutrients that help support our endogenous synthesis of collagen, like vitamin C, vitamin A, copper, iron, zinc, things like that, as well as a lack of collagen is going to cause a decrease in your capillary strength in the arteries. And that's going to cause them to potentially rupture, bleed, and create the clots of ischemic strokes and heart attacks. So there's also a cardiovascular benefit perspective. And scurvy as well. That's what we wrote about that the bleeding gums is actually like a collagen deficiency. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, basically, there was there was one publication it was in, I think, I'm not sure if they were pacifists or, or exactly what group they were in, but they refused to go to war. And in order to get out of going to war, um, I think this was World War II, they had to go into these scurvy vitamin C depletion studies. And a lot of symptoms uh, <laughs> representing coronary thrombosis would actually occur with vitamin C deficiency, um, like chest pains um, and, and bleeding in the myocardium. And so it, 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 we have kind of like human experiment experiment showing that a vitamin C deficiency um, potentially causes bleeds in the heart and symptoms of coronary thrombosis. Yeah. Yeah. Like the studies in the world war two were pretty uh, less uh, ethical or less uh, ethical concerns for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. So uh, vitamin C copper is uh, kind of the, like a uh, mineral that makes the collagen like tighter or stronger like the final step of making the actual collagen you know tangled and uh, more cross-linked together yep yeah the enzyme is called uh, lysyl oxidase and it's a, a copper dependent enzyme it also depends on vitamin c as well so vitamin c helps to stimulate the messenger rna in the um, cartilage cells that synthesize collagen so from that aspect it actually vitamin c is what helps to synthesize collagen but it also helps strengthen collagen because it improves lysyl oxidase as well as copper, which is needed to cross-link type one collagen. And the reason why um, most collagens aren't uh, necessarily cross-linked, it's the type one, which is why it's so strong. On a gram for gram basis, type one collagen is stronger than steel because of copper and vitamin C's ability to cross-link it and increase its strength. Hmm. Yeah, so you need to pretty much eat you know, not only like high collagen and glycine diet, but also you, yeah, you need like the micros there as well, like a whole uh, yeah. healthy diet overall. In other words, like people shouldn't just be consuming muscle meat. They should be adding organs like liver, which um, organs have more collagen and glycine as well as muscle meat, but they also contain more um, of the copper, the vitamin A, um, some, some more vitamin C as well in, in organs uh, compared to muscle meat to help support collagen synthesis as well. 
And then of course, I personally believe that we should be balancing the acid load from animal foods with either fruits, vegetables, or alkaline supplements or waters, because there are costs to excreting high amounts of acid, one of which is the breakdown of connective tissue, aka collagen, to get at the glutamine to form the ammonia to excrete the acid. So um, balancing the acid-base balance uh, by consuming, you, you have to consume really two to one, uh, two times the amount of vegetables on a mass perspective compared to, or on a weight perspective compared to um, animal foods like meat in order to fully offset the acid. But if you can't do that, I, I'm, most of the time I'm taking one to two grams of sodium citrate with all my animal-based meals, um, even if I consume vegetables with it, because there doesn't seem to be any negatives to having more a, a more, let's say, negative net acid excretion to be more slightly alkaline. Um, there's actually probably benefits to that by boosting. You're already most likely depleted by carbonate stores if you uh, have been on a Western diet for a while. Right. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And I, I guess like the one last main point we can cover is like the exercise. So, you know, exercise, especially like weight bearing exercise and, you know, force impact, uh, like high force impact on the joints does also like, you know, obviously strengthen bones and bone density, but also helps with collagen synthesis. Um, and uh, yeah, like what, what can you tell us about that? So most people are taking collagen supplements at sort of a suboptimal time. Most people will just dump it in their coffee, which is not to say that, that that's, there's nothing to do with like um, the coffee or the high temperature, like basically inhibiting the benefits of the collagen. It's the fact that you really want to take collagen optimally to support collagen synthesis around the time of exercise. So somewhere between, you know, an hour before to an hour after would likely be more optimal because you're going to have more blood flow to the tendons and ligaments, which already have a low baseline blood flow to help deliver those collagen peptides and amino acids to the source that you're trying to improve. So it, it would be optimal to take your collagen supplement one hour before or within an hour after of exercise due to the enhanced blood flow. And we talk about certain supplements too, that can help increase blood flow during exercise or foods that are high in nitrates, like arugula, um, like certain lettuces um, or, or beetroot, if you can tolerate that, will further enhance nitrate oxide production and blood flow delivery and help deliver those collagen peptides to the source of action where they need to actually go. Um, so I think it's important too to maybe have a little bit of vitamin C as well, not a ton, but like just 50 milligrams of vitamin C around that time as well will further help with collagen synthesis slash strengthening. And, you know, I think any type of exercise, even stretching too, will help increase some of the blood flow as well to the tendons and ligaments. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, good tip. And I guess, yeah, like many people, uh, generally yeah haven't you know considered <laughs> that 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 it's actually important to take it you know around the exercise at least for the joints i would imagine like maybe for the skin benefits you can take it at any, any other time but for the joints especially you need it at the exercise time i mean well what's even interesting too is that if you exercise high enough um, or more vigorously enough you will get significant increased blood flow to the skin to dump the heat so you may it might actually be super um, sort of like a super saturating way to actually deliver collagen to the skin um, close to exercise. If you're exercising hard enough to where you're dumping heat out of the skin through an enhanced blood vessel dilation and delivery of blood flow, blood to the skin um, to dump the heat. So actually uh, it, I think regardless taking collagen close to exercise will help due to that. But what a lot of people don't realize is that bone health um, is really important for not just from the fact that, you know, if you fall and you have an increased chance of breaking your bone, that can lead to death, which is a really big problem in the elderly. But in athletes as well, bone health is extremely important. And 50% of your bone is made up of protein, of which somewhere around 80 to 90% of that protein is made up of collagen. So collagen is just as important to bone health as minerals and bone mineral density. And a lot of these athletes that, especially let's say MMA fighters that are breaking their bones could simply just be having a collagen or glycine deficit. And so just from a, 
we tend to neglect the bones because you can't physically see them, but bone health and bone mineral density dramatically goes down as we age. And so supporting bone health with collagen as well as minerals and vitamins, I think is definitely a missing link for a lot of people. Mm, yeah, definitely. I agree. After uh, doing all the research and uh, the writing and stuff like that, I, I agree <laughs> that it actually had like very important I'm, and now I'm yeah I, I took it you know before the collagen and glycine but now I'm taking it yeah more uh, pretty much yeah more religiously or <laughs> paying more attention uh, to that yeah and uh, yeah where can people get the book yeah so the collagen cure will be available on kindle and paperback on amazon um, so that would be the best place to get it awesome and uh, yeah where can people find you and your socials uh, yeah, my website is drjamesdenick.com. I also have a YouTube. So if they just Google Dr. James Dinick Antonio YouTube, um, that'll pull it up as well. And Instagram is at Dr. James Dinick, D I N I C. Awesome. And uh, yeah, it was exciting to write the book. And I think it's going to be very, very beneficial for many people to, you know, learn about the importance of uh, collagen and uh, glycine. So uh, yeah, it was uh, great talking with you. And I'll see you. I'll see you around. You too, Sim. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you want to support this podcast, then check out our sponsors and leave our review on iTunes or Spotify. My name is Sim. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.